thank you very much. And I also want to join my other fellow members of the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations in thanking Stefania and her colleagues at the HCLU for hosting us. It's been a, a great several days visit with you. We've learned a great deal and we're honored to be in your company and in the struggle for, for rights and justice. Uh, the, the title of this, of this conference, The Role of Civil Societies in Increasingly Authoritarian Regimes, is one I want to take a little bit of a departure from because I think for human rights activists, it's especially important that we not engage in hyperbola or exaggeration uh, because part of what gives us our legitimacy is our precision of our analysis and the precision of our words. And so I, I don't come from an increasingly authoritarian regime or increasingly authoritarian country. I come from a country where there's a long-standing commitment and dedication to human rights, at least in principle, uh, in rhetoric often. Um, I come in, from a country where we're seeing enormous progress on some very important human rights issues. We are on the cusp of having full equality of LGBT individuals in America. That will happen within the next year or so, I, I believe, I, I speculate. We've seen enormous change over the last two years on prison reform issues in the U.S., where the U.S. has finally recognized that even though we only have 5% of the world's population, we have 25% of the world's prison population, and we have systematically now begun a process of reform both at the national level and at state and local levels to depopulate the prisons, and we're seeing enormous progress there on, on many fronts. And so I, I think it is important to start out by saying that you know, the U.S. is a country where there is a deep-seated understanding or at least uh, a, a, a commitment to questions of human rights and equality and where we can tap into those uh, reservoirs of goodwill, we can make change. Uh, and I think the narrative of the, the commitment to the Constitution, the commitment to individual freedoms is one that we consciously try to, to utilize as, as aggressively as we can in our advocacy work. However, I would say that while we don't live in a, while we Americans don't live in an in a authoritarian country, we are seeing the rise of anti-democratic policies and anti-democratic politics. And I will just say that uh, I've been the director of the American Civil Liberties Union. It's an organization that's 94 years old in the U.S. Uh, with the country's oldest and largest domestic human rights organization. And I would say that uh, as the sixth director of my organization in this 94-year history, the last 13 years that I have personally been directly involved with the ACLU has been enormous, uh, a moment of enormous um, setback for the struggle for rule of law and human rights. And if President Bush was the architect of such anti-democratic policies. I think that President Barack Obama is the legitimizer of many of those policies. And that is not exaggeration. That is not hyperbola. Um, in some ways, I think the, Ob the Obama administration has been even more problematic because of the evaporation of any organized opposition. Policies that were in place, put in place by President Bush and had vigorous dissent and opposing viewpoints have largely uh, evaporated in the last six years. And I think the, the, the implosion of any opposition to those policies has created even a more perilous moment for rule of law and democracy in the U.S. Um, as Isfahan Rev said this morning, when the rule of law becomes the law of rule, that is a very difficult moment for democracies. And the Obama administration has established a new normal on many of its national security civil liberties policies that is more about the law of rule than the rule of law. Uh, I'll take four quick examples where I'll just clip you through uh, issues that play out in America 
under the Obama administration. Torture. What was once unthinkable that would be sanctioned at the highest levels of the American government, where the highest levels of government officials would legally sign off on the use of torture. Uh, if you had asked me when I started my job uh, a week before September 11th, I would have said to you that's not possible in America. We see torture in our prisons. Uh, we see torture in local communities, but we would never have torture sanctioned by individuals who occupied the West Wing of the White House. And the unthinkable happened. That the highest levels of our government, all the way up to the presidency, I believe, uh, were directly involved with providing the legal sanctioning of torture. Now, President Obama tried to put the genie back in the bottle by, by eliminating the use of coercive interrogation techniques and eliminating the use of torture techniques. But no government official has been held accountable for the violation of domestic and international human rights law. No high-level government official in the age of Obama has been held accountable for waterboarding one of the ACLU's clients 183 times. No government official has been asked to fully explain the process by which that torture was sanctioned by our government. And our president insists that we have to look forward and not back, and uses all of the powers of his considerable office to obfuscate the full reality of government-sanctioned torture in those years. In that way, the president, uh, President Obama has become the accomplice of President Bush, because by obfuscating any effort to bring to light the true and full reality of the torture, and by refusing to hold individuals accountable who broke the law domestically and internationally, he has become complicit as to the Bush crimes. Now, we have at this very moment in Guantanamo, a group of ACLU lawyers have been able to secure a judicial order from a military judge that would entitle them to the full chronology of the torture that was perpetrated against their clients. That is not a small matter. That is, the, the Guantanamo military commissions I'll talk about in a minute are not systems of fair justice. But we even convinced this one judge in the military court, who's a military officer, to say that for these cases to go forward, the defense lawyers must be given the complete chronology of the torture that those individuals experienced at the hands of U.S. government officials. And the Obama administration lawyers have refused to turn over the evidence that that military judge has mandated that they deserve and they need to defend the interests of their clients. And so they find themselves now unable to proceed with the trial because the government refuses to turn over the very documents that the military commission judge says they must have. And the military commission judge is not independent enough to hold the U.S. government lawyers in contempt for failure to produce the documents under a judicially ordered mandate. Taking Gitmo a step further, this is the example two. Uh, Gitmo is, in Isfahan's words, I would call it the American gulag, right? It's a prison camp that was established literally to be a human rights free zone in a geography where the American government thought that no law, domestic or international, would govern it. And we still have close to 180 individuals who are held at Guantanamo. We have individuals who have been not charged or tried, who have been languishing in jail for more than 12 years, who have now begun as an effort to protest their unlawful detention by engaging in hunger strikes. And the Obama administration has gone to court and succeeded 
at having a judge mandate the force feeding of Guantanamo detainees who say, I would rather protest my unlawful detention by not taking food or water than remain indefinitely in this prison camp without rights. And our judiciary, our judge, called it an, an exasperating situation for her, but still then allowed the Obama administration to engage in direct force feeding of the detainees. You have the president who has willingly allowed his hands to be tied by Congress. You hear Amer Americans often talk about the gridlock between the two political parties. But it's a bit more of a, of a, of a collusion among uh, allies who are glad to just sit in traffic rather than move forward. Uh, the administration, for instance, the executive branch, as we read our law and we read the, the history, has complete and exclusive power over whom to prosecute where. That is not in the jurisdiction of the legislative branch. The executive branch with the Department of Justice is exclusively charged with the ability of deciding what individual to charge in what jurisdiction and where. Congress passes a law saying that the individuals at Guantanamo cannot be charged stateside. The administration could very well pick up that battle and challenge that law in court saying that it is an unconstitutional fettering of executive branch powers. And yet they choose to hold their hands behind their back and allow them to be tied by Congress because it's not a solution they actually want to uh, find, uh, come to fruition. We have our lawyers at Guantanamo, where the ACLU as a private organization has provided more than $7 million over the last six years in the legal defense teams to the Guantanamo military commissions because the federal government refuses to adequately resource them. And so in cases where individuals are literally faced with, uh, with execution, where they are assigned only one lawyer from the U.S. government who has no experience in capital trials or terrorism trials, we have brought a, a, a team of the, the country's leading experts on national security and at our expense provide them to the defendants because we think that such a poorly resourced court would not be a, a, a place where American justice would be served. We confront some of the same issues that were discussed before, where we had to discuss very vigorously within the ACLU, do we engage a system that we know is illegitimate and that is inadequate, or do we sit aside and criticize it from outside? And like we heard from our Russian colleagues, even though we fully know that the legal system at Guantanamo and the military commissions is not any true system of fairness and justice, we engage the system and work with the system as anemic and difficult as it is to make it more robust and to make the resources available to the defendants. We find, though, that six months ago when our lawyers were sitting with their clients in the attorney-client rooms where they're, where they're provided at Guantanamo, that somehow it was leaked that in the smoke detectors above their conference tables, were listening devices that could, could then record the attorney-client conversations between the defendants and our lawyers. When we brought this to the attention of the court, the, ju the, the Justice Department responded, well, the listening devices might be there, but we haven't turned them on. And if we've turned them on, we haven't listened to the conversations. And if we listen to the conversations, the prosecutors have not been given that information. Now you tell me how, even if that were true, even if we were silly enough to believe it, what type of chilling effect does that have between an attorney and his or her client the subsequent day when they go back to meet that very same room? How can any lawyer feel that he, can, he or she can discharge their duties properly knowing that there's a specter, that there's a listening device that might or might not be turned on or might or might not be listened to 
or might or might not be relayed to your adversary in the court? How can you possibly have a vigorous relationship between an attorney and his or her client? You go to drones, our president, knowing that his public and the constituents have wearied on two wars which have cost thousands of American lives and tens of thousands of civilian life in Iraq and Afghanistan, has found a very expedient solution to wars. Rather than sending boots on the ground or troops whose mothers or fathers or husbands and wives vote in American elections, we send machines. We send machines to bomb in Afghanistan or Pakistan. We send unmanned machines to bomb in Yemen. Leaving aside a very significant part about the civilian loss of life of Pakistani, Afghani, Yemeni life, for an American civil liberties organization, among the most problematic is the fact that three American citizens have been assassinated by our government using these drones. Three American citizens, two of whom were specifically targeted, one of whom just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. These three individuals were ex executed without any judicial proceeding by their own government outside of the specter of the battlefield. They were in Yemen. So far as I know as an American, there's been no declaration of war in Yemen. And these individuals being targeted and killed by the American government, now we bring lawsuits on behalf of their family members trying to challenge the fact that the government has not had any form of due process, has not had any form of review of the policies or practices of the drone assassinations. And we find that the, Amer the American government is all too quick to brag about its drone policy. We read in a New York Times front page editorial that President Obama himself is the one who reads the dossiers before individuals are targeted for assassination. Now, it's really quite a breathtaking expose given by the government officials when they say that our president is the one who holds those documents with his very own hands and decides which American citizen to execute without ju judge, jury, or the right of an appeal. One of the three individuals was a 16-year-old boy whose father, Anwar Laki, had gone to Yemen and his little boy was wondering, where's dad? Let me go find him. He went to Yemen to visit his family, to connect with his father, and he, sitting in a cafe with other of his friends who were Yemeni, had a bomb dropped on him by his own government, a 16-year-old boy. Now, we've been litigating this issue from the beginning, even before Mr. Alaki was targeted, even before Mr. Alaki was executed. We are now litigating to get the, the legal memoranda that is supposed to be the underlying analysis of how any government official believes that you can target American citizen for assassination without rule of law. What is curious is that the biggest battle we've had on the drone issue over the last month has been with our allies, the liberals. There is, a, there is a fine man who I've never met, apparently fine, I believe it because I've been told it, who is a good liberal. He believes in the rights of women, of abortion rights, LGBT rights. He votes Democratic, capital D. He's a good, he worked with one of the most liberal judges on the Ninth Circuit, this Mr. Barron. He was nominated by the Obama administration to serve as a federal judge uh, the, on the First Circuit, which would be a life appointment. The problem with Mr. Barron is that he was also the author of the drone memo that would lay out the legal justification whereby the American government could target and assassinate one of its own citizens. When the ACLU raised concerns that Mr. Barron ought not be confirmed for a lifetime appointment as a federal judge 
to interpret the Constitution without the public being able to see the very legal analysis that he has put down on paper on a case of first impression and said that un until and unless we see the memo, we suggest that the Senate not vote on his nomination. And our biggest critics were the NGOs of civil society who said, he's very good on women. How can you stop his nomination? He's great on gay rights. How can you stop his nomination? And we had to stand firm and say, we represent the family of Anwar Alaki. We represent a grandfather who lost his son and his grandson. And that American permanent resident deserves to know how this lawyer working for our government justified the execution of an American citizen under existing case law. Now, what you find here is that if Mr. Barron had been nominated by President Bush, all hell would have broken loose. All of our allies who were criticizing us for raising the questions would have been up in arms with us. But because it falls along partisan lines, we found ourselves as the only organization willing to ask the questions around a liberal appointment to a, per, to a lifetime judgeship based on the drone issue. And I think it goes back to the question that Amr raised around the, the, the perilous nature of aligning civil liberties with politics too closely. We earn our keep when we're willing to ask the tough questions of our allies and friends. Surveillance, I'm wrapping up. I know I'm going along. Here we have, with the, uh, with the ex exposés of uh, the journalists who were providing information by Edward Snowden, we now know that the government has been collecting records of all Americans' phone calls and emails for the last 12 years. We also know, to a lesser extent, we know, that they've also been tracking the emails and phone calls of foreign nationals. Remarkable that my democracy doesn't take its oversight at all seriously. And it's remarkable that some of us still believe in the system, notwithstanding what we've seen in recent months. You'll see my bit of sarcasm is justified when I, rem when I tell you that in March of 2013, the National Director of Intelligence, the highest ranking government official in charge with national surveillance, was asked by a U.S. Senator under oath the following question. Mr. Clapper was asked by uh, Senator Wyden this question. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? The response from, Senator Cla from uh, National Director of Intelligence, Mr. Clapper, under oath, says, no, sir, not willingly. Now, when we have a government official who lies to the Senate under oath, and when we have a lack of willingness to hold that government official accountable for perjury in front of our elected officials, and when the administration does not fire Mr. Clapper the day after he lies under oath to the elected representatives of people, our democracy is fundamentally compromised. Edward Snowden's revelations came out three months later. In fact, Mr. Snowden describes that incident as the straw that broke the camel's back. When he saw his bo boss lie under oath to the Senate, this young 28-year-old man took it upon himself to release data that would show the perjury, the lies, the indiscretions of the American government to the world's people. The reform efforts, even though they've been triggered in courts and Congress and the executive branch, are completely emasculated. You must not be fooled by any efforts that you hear about reform efforts passed by Congress. The loopholes they have carved in the last week in behind closed door sessions with the Senate and the House and the administration fundamentally changed all the terms of the reform legislation that we worked on. It is a lot of reform 
only in theory, not in practice. The loopholes will be as broad and as large would allow the government to do exactly what it has done up until this point. Now, I close with this. These, on these four issues, on the lack of accountability for torture, on the lack of due process on Guantanamo, on the use of drones for extrajudicial killings, even of American citizens, and on the use of dragnet secret surveillance kept from the American people, what's really happened in the US? You have, obviously, the hypocrisy of the Obama administration. You have a turning point in American politics, which was once seen as an aberration of a bad president has now become the new normal for presidents, Democrat and Republican alike. And I dare say that the, the implications of these decisions, explicit decisions to continue the same policies of the Bush administration under the, under the administration of Barack Obama, has heralded a different moment, not just in American history, but also in global history, in international history. I, I think, as an American, I am Sorry and sad to say, but the sun has fully set on any legitimacy of American leadership on human rights. That period is over. What FDR began in the aftermath of World War II, Barack Obama ended with these policies in his presidency. President Obama is fundamentally hamstrung to deal with the human rights issues of our day, for instance, in Russia, because of the existence of Edward Snowden in Putin's Moscow, and because of his effort to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law a whistleblower who brought unconstitutional and illegal activity to the public's light. Mr. Snowden, if he were back in America, he'd spend the rest of his life in jail. For each one of the documents that he may have taken, there's, a, there's at least a 10-year charge per document. The, in, under the Espionage Act, there is no mitigating evidence and no other excuse that could be made for him taking the documents he took. There is no question that the government would detain him for the rest of his life if the American government got his hands on him. And so the lessons for us as, as civil society organizations working in increasingly anti-democratic regimes is that we have to expose. We have to be willing to take the heat of the human rights kitchen by exposing the abuses. We have to be assiduous in documenting that which they will hide from us because the government will be all too quick and all too energetic to hide from our public knowledge that which the public needs to know. We need to invigorate and work with the legal systems, even if they're anemic and inadequate, as we give them greater life. We have to advocate reform. We have to hold our friends, especially our friends, to the highest of standards, and we must never be captured by any political party. And most importantly for the human rights NGO community, we have to survive. Because we have to be able to know that as we do this work, we will outlast every president that comes or goes. That already our conversations have pivoted to Senator Rand Paul, a Republican, a Libertarian, Many say that he might be the next person to occupy the Oval Office. We've already begun our conversations with him around amnesty for Snowden. We've begun our conversations around NSA surveillance, accountability for torture. And the, the part that we must take as NGO leaders and NGO uh, uh, advocates is that we must have the staying power and the stamina to outlast any particular political figure and have the ability to hold future political figures accountable, day in, day out. Because they will come and go. But if we do our jobs right, our human rights organizations will be here to stay. Thank you very much.